Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for this Bible study. We continue studying about the results of salvation. Last week we have seen a couple of, uh, we have done a couple of Bible studies on the subject of spiritual circumcision and how this is a very important operation or surgery that God performs in the born again believer or in the sinner who trusts Jesus Christ as a savior and separates his soul and his body from each other. It's very important because this is what uh, gives the sinner, the born again Christian, the ability to live a holy life. And also it uh, enables him to enter heaven with a soul that is washed in the blood of Jesus Christ because the sins of the body no longer affect the soul. As we have seen in the Old Testament times and even in the New Testament times, the soul of an unsaved person is stuck to his body and therefore the sins of the body affect the soul. And we have also seen that there are perversions of this true doctrine, true doctrine, especially in the first five centuries, but that doesn't negate the truth of God's word. Today we are going to look at the second important doctrine uh, related to our salvation, the result, the second result of our uh, salvation, and that is baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Again, this is a much a misunderstood subject among Christians, especially since the entrance of the charismatic. Uh, heresy, this doctrine has been corrupted and perverted to an extent where even those who do not believe the same things as the charismatics do uh, seem to back off when it comes to this doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But this is a very important doctrine and it is related to our salvation. It is one of the results of the Lord Jesus Christ saving our soul. Let's turn once again to the same passage that we had looked at when we studied spiritual circumcision and that is Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we will read uh, verses 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12 and focus particularly on verse 12. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's the first thing that happens when you are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in his death and resurrection. Verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now this verse says that we were buried with him in baptism. And we have risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. What is this operation of God? What is this phrase, faith of the operation of God? It means by faith in the operation of God or by faith in the work of God. Of course, some Bible teachers would connect this with spiritual circumcision, which probably you can do. But for me, this is more connected with what uh, you know with this Holy Spirit baptism than with spiritual circumcision this baptism of the Holy Spirit is God's work and I think it's especially also connected to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ because this is the work of God raising the Lord Jesus Christ back to life was a work of God he did it by his power by his spirit as we read elsewhere in the scriptures. So it says we were buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye were risen with him. Through the faith of the operation of God. Who hath raised him from the dead. So God raising him from the dead. Is that operation. Operation doesn't always mean a surgery. Well it could mean. But it, it's not always a surgery. Right. It is a work. It is something that God has performed. Raising Christ from the dead is the operation of God. By faith of the operation of God doesn't mean, uh, you know, let me just put it very simply, just means by faith in 
the operation of God who raised him from the dead. So I think that much is quite clear. And now we can go into the details of what the Bible teaches about being buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him. The first thing that we must make note of is this fact that when we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now we have to be very careful here because there are two extreme heresies connected with this baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first one is to equate this baptism of the Holy Spirit with water baptism. With water baptism. Every time Christians see the word baptism, they equate it with water baptism. You must be careful about that. And the second thing is a baptism of the Holy Spirit as a second blessing. As a second blessing. These are the two false teachings. These are false. And you must be very careful about these false teachings. Because uh, you can get messed up with your doctrine and even with your life, your practical Christian life, if you're not careful about these things. Alright, so we will talk a little bit about that later. But the first thing I want you to understand is that we have been baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. Water baptism doesn't put you into Christ. It's impossible. Like I've said, every time you see the word baptism, do not associate it with water. Like for example, some Christians, every time they see the word water, they associate that word with baptism. So both are wrong. Every time you see water, don't think it's water baptism. Every time it says baptism in your Bible, don't think it's water baptism. In fact, the Bible teaches about seven different baptisms. All right. But I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4. And if you already know this verse, you would think that I'm contradicting myself when I say that there are seven baptisms at least mentioned in the Bible. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. There is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. It says one body, one spirit, even as you are called uh, in one hope of your calling. So it's talking about how there are some things which are unique. All right. Now look at verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One baptism, it says. But I'm saying that there are at least seven baptisms mentioned in the Bible and there are and you can search the scriptures and you will find the seven different baptisms mentioned in the Bible all the baptisms mentioned in the Bible are not the same you must be very careful about that let me just tell you there is water baptism then there is spirit baptism these are two different baptisms right there is the baptism of John the Baptist then there is the baptism that a born-again Christian takes in this church age. these are two different things so every time the word baptism occurs, it's not water baptism. Like in John 3, when Jesus says you must be born of water and of the spirit, Christians immediately add the word baptism to the word water there. And say, unless you're baptized in water, right? And unless you're born of the spirit, these two things, you cannot be, uh, you know, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. They don't see that that water that Jesus talks about in John 3, 5 has nothing to do with baptism. It's got to do with your physical birth. Verse 6 clearly explains it. There are two things he says there. You must be born of water and of the spirit. And in verse 6, Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So water is to do with the fleshly birth and the spirit is to do with the spiritual birth. It's very clear right there in the context. So there are denominations which have water baptism as a part of the plan of salvation written down in their statements of faith, in their confessions, in their creeds. Isn't that horrible? But that's true. That's because they fail to rightly divide the word of truth. They do that. So they take water baptism 
and confuse it with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The one baptism that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4 and verse 5 is a saving baptism and it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's got nothing to do with water baptism. All right, you must keep that in mind. So when the Bible says that we have been baptized in Colossians chapter 2, that we were buried with him in baptism, what exactly is he talking about? The word baptism we know means to immerse, right? And that's the only correct way of administering baptism, all right? Some Christians think, oh, it doesn't matter which mode of baptism uh, is used. No, it does. And I think as far as I know, only the Baptists have it right. This baptism is by immersion because it is pointing to something that happened inside that sinner. That is that he died with Christ, he was buried and he rose up again. It talks about how Christ died for his sins, was buried and rose up again. So it is symbolic. Your baptism, your water baptism is symbolic of what happened. So baptism basically means immersion. All right. And uh, this immersion is into Christ. He says we were buried with him in baptism. So baptism basically means immersion. It's immersion into Christ. And we will look at what the Bible says about this immersion, being immersed with Christ or into Christ. We will look at all these things. But the thing that you must keep in mind is that when the sinner comes to Jesus Christ here in this church age, when the sinner comes to Jesus Christ, it is, uh, you know, he trusts the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes to the cross. He believes that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and rose up again, that uh, he made a blood atonement for his sins. He trusts the name of Jesus Christ. He receives him as his savior and he is born again. And it is at this moment of salvation that he is uh, baptized by the Holy Spirit. It is not a second blessing as the charismatics teach. This is very important. So the moment of salvation is when the baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place. The baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place right here when he, at the moment of his salvation. It is not something that happens later. Just as spiritual circumcision is something that happens at the moment of salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at the moment of salvation. I want you to see the connection between these two while we are talking about it. The moment your soul and your body are separated, that's when the Holy Spirit baptizes you, your soul. All right? Uh, because till that moment, your soul and your body were stuck together. And the Spirit of God cannot baptize your body because there is sin in your body. But your soul, you see, has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your soul has been washed from all its filth and its sins that were on it because of the sins that were done in the body. Now your soul is clean. And this clean, washed soul, saved soul, is baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me briefly address the problem of the charismatic teaching on this subject as they teach that baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that you receive after your salvation. They call it a second blessing, right? I'm not going to go into all the details. I'm going to just show you that that is wrong from the scriptures, all right? And uh, they teach, of course, that sometimes you might have to pray and tarry for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Like... You know, they allude to Acts chapter 2. They don't see <clears throat> the details there in Acts chapter 2. They just say that the apostles were together, the disciples were together. They were tarrying for the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came upon them. So they have these tarrying meetings. They have these fasting and prayer meetings for 40 days and 40 nights. Right? And uh, they get messed up. 
most of these charismatics and Pentecostals, not the charismatics, but the Pentecostals, uh, who have these staring meetings are not very sincere. All right. They don't really fast for 40 days and 40 nights. They eat and they uh, drink, uh, you know, drinks that give them energy. So they are all right. But there are some very sincere people, sincerely deluded people among the uh, Pentecostals. They literally fast for 40 days and 40 nights without eating anything or drinking uh, even water. I've seen some people like that. A couple of people I know, or maybe at least one person I know, got demon possessed and he lost his mind. He lost his mind completely. Even till today, it's been more than uh, probably 15 years since that happened. He's totally demon possessed. He's like one of those guys that you read about in the Bible. Demon possessed people in the Bible. It's horrible. That's what can happen if you fast for 40 days and 40 nights. They think, well, Moses did that. Paul did that probably when he went to Arabia. Jesus Christ certainly did that. Right? So they think we can do it. No, you cannot. Moses was God's chosen person to give the law to Israel. He had a special purpose. You cannot compare yourself with Moses or with his work. All right, I know that they were all men of like passions as we are and all that. But that is to do with living for the Lord. But when it comes to doing something that God called us to do, you cannot compare your work with what Moses was called to do. He gave the law to Israel. Right? He was probably the greatest uh, uh, spiritual leader of Israel. When it comes to Paul, Paul was chosen by God to be the apostle to the Gentiles and the revelation of the gospel of the grace of God, which was to be preached to the whole world for about 2000 years, was given to Paul. He had a special work by God. So if he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible doesn't uh, you know, very clearly say that, but probably he did like Moses and like the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no uh, surprise in that because, you know, it was a special purpose that God had for Paul. And when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't have to explain anything. You know the special purpose which, with which the Lord Jesus Christ came down to this world to die for your sins and mine and for the whole world. So these three men had their own special purpose. If you talk about Elijah, right, he was a special person. He was like the representatives of the prophets. So don't compare yourself and don't try these things. You'll go mad. The least that will happen is you will go mad and the worst is you'll get demon possessed. Because when you are hungry and thirsty, uh, you know, at that point, you are at your weakest. All right. And uh, that's not God's will at all. And when you're in that condition where your mind and your body are very vulnerable, evil spirits will come in. Yes, even if you're a born again Christian evil spirits can enter into your body. So you must be careful about this teaching of tarrying for the Holy Spirit to come, fasting and praying for the Holy Spirit to come. Of course, they associate it with tongues. They say that if you're really baptized by the Holy Spirit, the evidence of it is speaking in tongues, which is again a bunch of nonsense. There were times in the Bible when the baptism of the Holy Spirit took place after salvation yes but those are only exceptions to the rule and remember exceptions only prove the rule the rule is that everybody gets baptized by the holy spirit the moment they are saved but there are some exceptions and god uh, had those exceptions for a reason very quickly uh, very quickly in acts chapter 2 in acts chapter 2 we read in verses 1 to 4, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were all in one accord in one place, but nobody was praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Keep that in mind. The, the Pentecostals erroneously teach this, that they were praying for the Holy Ghost to come upon them. They weren't. Verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. 
where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they would say, look what happened here. These apostles and disciples were already saved. Yes, they were already saved. That's, that's a fact. They didn't get saved in Acts chapter 2. But what is happening here in Acts chapter 2, you must keep in mind, is that in Acts 2, it is the formation of the body of Christ. It's the formation of the body of Christ. That's what was happening here. And uh, that's why you see that there is a delay in this baptism of the Holy Spirit. The apostles, the disciples were saved. They already believed in Jesus Christ. They believed. And you know, there was enough evidence. There was infallible evidence given to them of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They saw it with their own eyes. They believed. Even though initially they were hesitant to believe it, later on they all believed. Right? They saw the Lord, they communed with Him, they ate together with Him. But that was not, you know, though the Lord Jesus Christ put the Spirit on them in those days, He didn't form together, uh, form them together into one spiritual body. Did, they, did the disciples have the Holy Spirit already? Yes, remember, even before He died, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit. But what's happening in Acts chapter 2 is a baptism of the Holy Ghost which puts them together into one body and it is the formation of the body of Christ. It's a once for all act of God. He formed it there. Yes, I believe the body of Christ was, was uh, you know, formed in Acts chapter 2. I'm not a hyper dispensationalist. So... Hyper dispensationalists, that's what they teach, you know, that the body of Christ was not formed here. You ask them where, some will say 9, some will say even 28 of Acts, or even later probably. But that's not true. All these disciples and apostles were in the body of Christ in Acts chapter 2, even before Paul got saved. And Paul makes it very clear in his epistles, makes that very clear. So this is the, f the first coming down of the Holy Ghost to form the body of Christ. And I'm talking about the spiritual body of Christ. They were already a local church, you see. They were already an assembly. They were all together, a local body. But God made a spiritual body out of them. He baptized them into the body of Christ. It, it happened in Acts chapter 2 and it continues to happen today. Everyone who is saved is baptized at the moment of salvation into this body of Christ. Now look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Verses 14 through 17. Verses 14 through 17 of Acts chapter 8. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid there they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So here you have this uh, incident recorded in the scriptures, which the Pentecostals will point out to you and say, look what happened. This group of uh, disciples in Samaria had received the word of God. That means they were saved. But they were not baptized by the Holy Ghost. But what happened? They were already baptized in water. All right. So they heard the word. They received the word of God. First step. Secondly, they took water baptism to symbolize what happened, you know, uh, with them, what Jesus Christ did for them. But the Holy Ghost had not yet fallen upon any of them. That means, like what happened in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit didn't come and baptize them into the body of Christ. So what happened? Peter and John laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. 
So you see this being practiced by Pentecostals and even Charismatics in their churches. The pastor puts his hand right on the heads of these people who want to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And of course the evidence, they say, would be speaking in tongues. What is happening here in Acts chapter 8? In Acts chapter 8, notice that these are Samaritans. Who were the Samaritans? The Samaritans were half Jews, right? And if you go back and read in the Old Testament, you'll see that when uh, Israel and Judah were taken captive to Assyria and uh, to Babylon, the kings brought in people from other countries and put them in the land of Israel. And the people there married the Jews who were left over in Israel and the result are the Samaritans. They are half Jews. Right? We read about this uh, conversation that the Lord Jesus Christ had with a Samaritan woman. And he tells her that salvation is of the Jews. He says, you do not know what you're talking about. Salvation is of the Jews. He makes that distinction between the Samaritans and the Jews. Remember, in the first seven chapters of Acts, as I've always been teaching, I've mentioned this many times, but I'll still say it. Acts 1 to 7, God is dealing with the Jews, with Israel, only with the Jews. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down, who were there? They were all Jews. If there were any Gentiles, they were not uh, Gentiles who were worshipping other gods. They were proselytes. They had already believed in the God of Israel. They were proselytes to Judaism. They were Jewish people, all of them. And God was dealing with the Jews in Acts chapters 1 to 7. How did that end? That ended with the stoning of Stephen when they rejected the Messiah in Jerusalem, their Messiah in Jerusalem. And God turned from dealing with the Jews to the Gentiles slowly. So in Acts chapter 8, you find the gospel being given to the Samaritans who were only half Jews. And also in this chapter later, you will see the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, a Gentile, a, a proper Gentile. You see how the gospel is going away from the Jews to the Gentiles? After Acts chapter 7, when they rejected their Messiah and showed it by stoning Stephen, the deacon, uh, God does not do any major miracle in Jerusalem again. That's because God is done with the Jews temporarily. Because they rejected his son, he rejected them. And of course, in the book of Acts, God gives the Jews four chances in four different places. And all four places, they reject God. And what does Paul say in Acts 28? Well, you've rejected your Messiah. Now the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles permanently. When I say permanently, I mean that, you know, in this church age, it's no longer going to be directed towards the Jews like it was in the first seven chapters of Acts. So, the gospel was being given to the Samaritans. That's the first thing. The second thing is, remember, Jesus Christ gave Peter the key to the kingdom, right? Which the Roman Catholic Church claims was passed on to their popes, which is, again, uh, a pipe dream. It's rubbish. It's not true. The keys to the kingdom was opening the doors for the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter opened the keys of the kingdom for the Jews first in Acts chapter 2. Now he's opening the keys to the kingdom for the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 10 he opens the keys of the kingdom to the Jews when he preaches to Cornelius and his household. To the Gentiles, I'm sorry. That's what is happening. But the most important thing you must understand that is that Peter and John and the, up and the other apostles are not ordinary pastors like me or like the other pastors. We do not have the authority to lay hands on anyone and say, receive the Holy Ghost. An evil spirit might come into that person, but the Holy Spirit will not 
enter that person if I or any other pastor does it. Never go and ask a pastor to lay his hand on your head and pray. Don't ever do that. I don't know how it works in other countries, but especially here in India, you see that when you go to preach in a, another church, especially if you're going to the rural areas of India, to the villages, and you go to preach there, immediately after you preach, those innocent uh, believers come with a bottle of oil to you. And they say, Pastor, please put this oil on my head, put your hand on my head and pray. You ask them, who taught you to do this? Their pastor has been doing that all the while. You know what they're trying to do, these pastors? They're trying to assume a uh, higher position. This is Nicolaitanism, right? Trying to rule over the laity. The pastors try to make it look to the congregation that they are greater than the rest of the people. They are the anointed men of God or women of God also nowadays. We have the authority to lay hands. Don't ever think that the pastors that are there today are equal to the apostles. They are not. The apostles are special people that Jesus Christ chose for a special mission. That was to preach the gospel to the whole world and establish the church, found the church. They were the founders in one sense. Jesus Christ is, of course, but you know what the Bible says? Look at uh, Ephesians. Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Chapter, um, I think it's uh, in chapter 2. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Look at what the Bible is teaching. That the foundation of the church... Or at least, you know, the major part of the foundation of the church is the apostles and then the prophets. The prophets are those through whom God gave the scriptures, the New Testament. So, don't ever think a pastor today has the same authority as an apostle. No, we are not a part of the foundation of the body of Christ or of the church. No, we are not. The apostles were. Because it was the beginning of the church, you see. And God chose these special men and sent them out to establish the church. Look at uh, Second Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Second Corinthians 12 and verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The apostles had special signs given to them. Those were miracles and, you know, all these things that he mentioned. Signs and wonders and mighty deeds. They're not there today. Even though these Pentecostals and Charismatics claim to have these signs and wonders. Now, some very smart and crafty Charismatic and Pentecostal preachers realize this. That pastors are not the same as apostles. So they started calling themselves apostles now, right? Here in India, we have so many apostles. So there is this competition that goes on between these guys. It's very funny to watch. It's sad that they are making a mockery, right, of Christianity in the sight of the heathen. It's very sad. But when you actually sit down and look at what's happening, it's even funny sometimes. These people are very competitive, against each other. So one fellow calls himself a apostle. You know, it starts with, of course, pastor. Then another fellow says, I'm a bishop. He calls himself a bishop. You have these charismatic bishops. I'm not talking about the bishops in the established churches like the Lutheran Church or the Methodist or uh, uh, the Church of South India, the Church of North India here in India, the Anglican Church. We're not talking about that. You have these charismatic bishops. Then another fellow says, well, this fellow made himself a bishop, so I have to make myself higher than him. So he says, I'm an apostle. 
the funniest thing that I saw was that one fellow, charismatic fellow, he saw that pastors are ordinary people. The title bishop is okay, but still not as great as an apostle. But there are so many people who are calling themselves apostles. So you know what title he gave himself? He calls himself now a cardinal. Can you believe that? Cardinal so-and-so. Because he thinks cardinal is greater than an apostle. Because, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church, cardinals are the ones who elect the Pope. One of the cardinals generally becomes the Pope. So he thinks the Pope is somewhere up there. He can't call himself the Pope naturally, so he calls himself a cardinal. That's a joke that talks about their foolishness and ignorance. But this is true. This really happens. The apostles were special people. With, with a special purpose, with special gifts given to them. Paul calls it the signs of an apostle. None of these fellows have the signs of the apostles. All these fellows who claim to have, uh, you know, the gift of healing, the gift of tongues, the gift of miracles, are all rogues to the most part. Maybe some of them are deceived sincerely. They believe God has given them that gift. But to the most part, they know they don't have it. And they are like uh, street magicians pulling a fast one over God's people. It's very sad that millions of Christians are attracted to these false teachers who claim to have the signs of the apostle, of the apostles. Well, let's get back to this. Here, Peter is opening the doors of the kingdom of God to the Samaritans. But the thing is, the Samaritans being there in the first century, in the days that the apostles were alive, had to be brought under apostolic authority. Apostolic succession, apostolic authority. They had to be brought under this apostolic authority. That's why God established very clearly to the Samaritans that the apostles have greater power and calling and purpose than all the other Christians. And he proved it to them by allowing Peter and John to lay their hands on the heads of these Samaritan believers. And then when they did that, he sent the Holy Spirit upon them. Right? We read about that as we have already read in the book of Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And in verse 17... They laid their, uh, then laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Wow, that's something, right? Peter lays his hand, John lays his hand on these believers and they actually are baptized by the Holy Spirit. And they become a part of the body of Christ. So in Acts chapter 2, it was the formation of the body of Christ. In, the, uh, in Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans had to come under the authority of the apostles. That's because if they do not recognize the apostles' authority, then they would not learn from them really. right? They should know that whatever they learn, they should learn from these men that God has appointed uh, as teachers and preachers of the gospel. They were brought under apostolic authority. In another case where the Holy Ghost was given after people got saved and not at the moment of salvation is Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 6. It says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. In verse 7, all the men were twelve in number. So, who were these people and what's happening here? It says in Acts 19 verse 1, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were baptized in water. 
Verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now it looks like water baptism is associated with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, they were already baptized in water, and when they came up, Paul laid his hands. It was the laying on of hands. What's happening here in Acts 9? Now God is establishing I'm sure you have guessed Paul's authority as an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul's authority. Uh, because you see the revelation the revelation of the gospel of the grace of God right in this church age from let's say around Acts chapter 8 onwards you find the gospel of the grace of God this is not the gospel that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2 don't get confused with that the gospel of the grace of God is a Pauline revelation right they love to use such words Pauline Let's use that too, Pauline Revelation. And you find this Pauline Revelation in uh, his epistles from Romans right up till Philemon. And this is the gospel that is preached in this church age till the rapture of the church. So what was preached before that? Remember, John the Baptist did not preach the gospel of the grace of God. What did he preach? preach. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. John preached the gospel of the kingdom, which is different from the gospel of the grace of God. These are two different things. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news of the kingdom that the king is here on the earth and he's about to establish his kingdom. So what should you do? Repent of your sins and be baptized. That's what Paul, uh, John the Baptist preached. Is that what you preach? The king is here. He's going to establish the kingdom. Repent of your sins and be baptized. If that's what you're preaching, you're a fool. Nobody gets saved with that. You preach what Paul taught us as the gospel of the grace of God. In a nutshell, it is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. How Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose up again on the third day according to the scriptures. And by believing this, a sinner gets saved. This is the gospel of the grace of God. It's got nothing to do with the literal kingdom with the Lord Jesus, which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to establish at the second advent. It's got nothing to do with that. These are two different things. The church and the kingdom are not the same. You rightly divide the word of truth. John the Baptist preached the gospel of the kingdom. What did Peter preach in Acts chapter 2? He preached something similar to what John the Baptist preached. He was telling them, that you have rejected your king, your Messiah, you crucified him. He preached that to them. What was the response of the Jews? Did they say, sir, what must we do to be saved? Like the Philippian jailer said, no. What did they say? What must we do now? They said, oh, we've done a great and horrible thing. What should we do now? Peter says, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And uh, of course, he goes on talking about how their sins would be blotted out when the times of refreshing would come. But the thing is, God had already forgiven the Jews for crucifying their Messiah. You read about it in the book of Isaiah, how God already forgave them. So water baptism in Acts 2 had nothing to do with, uh, you know, forgiveness of sins or salvation and all that. They were already forgiven. He was just telling them to repent like God told, uh, like John the Baptist told the Jews to repent. And the kingdom will come if the Jews as a nation turn to God. That's what Peter was preaching about. Nothing to do with what Paul preached. 
Nothing to do even uh, with what Philip did with the Ethiopian eunuch, right? This is completely different. So what we are saying is that God wanted to establish Paul's authority and his revelation, the revelation that was given to him to show them that it is authoritative. The reason for this is because in all probability, these Jewish disciples whom Paul uh, laid hands on were firstly, of course, they were baptized with the baptism of John. It had nothing. Look, Paul says, Paul makes a clear distinction between John's baptism, even if it's just water baptism, and the Christian water baptism. He makes a distinction. He says, John's baptism is not the same as the baptism we take now. Because John's baptism did not point to the death and resurrection of Christ. But the Christian's baptism points to the death and resurrection of Christ. It's a symbol of the death and resurrection of Christ. It's the first thing. The second thing was, in all probability, these Jewish disciples were the disciples of Apollos that we read about in verse 1, even in chapter 18, uh, in verses 22, uh, 24 to 28, we read about Apollos. Right? And it says, for he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. He did this only after Aquila and Priscilla took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. You see, even Apollos didn't know this Pauline revelation. He was a mighty man of the scriptures in the, uh, of the Old Testament not the New Testament. And in all probability, he would have been a disciple of John or at least believed what John preached. That's all. But he had no clue about this Pauline revelation of the gospel of the grace of God. So God had to establish Paul's authority to Apollos and his disciples. He would have had many disciples, not just these 12, because he was preaching publicly and he was a mighty man convincing them through the scriptures about the Lord Jesus Christ being the Messiah of the Jews. But now, Apollos had to learn that God is finished with the Jews for a certain period of time, and now the gospel of the grace of God has to be preached both to the Jews and Gentiles. There's going to be just one body, not, not two different bodies, and Apollos had to learn that. right? In the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the problem he faced with Apollos and his disciples. They had to be brought under the authority of Paul. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 19. That's why Paul laid his hands on the disciples who believed in Jesus and were baptized in water. And then they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this whole charismatic teaching of second blessing is only, uh, uh, you know, the incidents that you find in the book of Acts are only exceptions to the rule and exceptions prove the rule. Also keep in mind this fact that Acts, Acts is a transitional book. It's a transitional book. What does it mean? You see a transition in the book of Acts of God's dealing. A transition from God's dealing with the Jews to God's dealing with the Gentiles. If you don't see this, you can never understand the book of Acts. There is a transition taking place. God dealing with the Jews to God's dealing with the Gentiles. Matthew is a transitional book. What is it a transition? It's a transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That's why in Matthew there is doctrine that is not applicable to the church age. That's why you see things in the book of Acts because of its nature. That is a transitional book. You see in the book of Acts things that happen which are not applicable to the church after Acts chapter 9 especially in this church age. Again, the book of Hebrews is a transitional book. What 
transition is Hebrews recording. It's a transition between the church age into the tribulation. From God's dealing with the Gentiles to God's dealing once again with the Jews. It is Jacob's trouble. Right? This is to do with the Jews. So God is going to deal with the Jews once again. So that transition is recorded in the book of Hebrews. That's why you see some really strange doctrines in the book of Hebrews which do not match what was taught by Paul. In fact, they sometimes contradict what was taught by Paul. So our great destructive Bible scholars, that's what they are, get into action and they go to the Greek and do their gymnastics to try and prove that there is no contradiction between the book of Hebrews and the teachings of Paul. No matter what you do, you cannot escape those contradictions. But those contradictions look like contradictions only when you do not rightly divide the word of truth. Once you rightly divide the word of truth, you see it's not a contradiction. It's just God changes his dealings. Right? He was dealing with Gentiles, with the whole world, through the gospel of the grace of God. Now he's going to deal with the Jews and once again it's going to be the gospel of the kingdom. Just like John the Baptist preached because Christ is going to come and establish his righteous reign upon the earth at the end of the tribulation. So in the tribulation period, they're going to preach about this kingdom that's going to come. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Like John the Baptist preached, like Peter preached. So this is Bible doctrine. This is something that is ignored. You know what the problem with most Bible teachers is? They don't believe the words of this book. That's the problem. They are very diligent in the work they do. Don't get me wrong, probably more diligent than some of us Bible believers are. They are very hardworking. They are very diligent. They are very, very, uh, you know, uh, focused on what they do. But most of the times, it's their work doesn't pass the surface and go down. It doesn't happen. It's just on the surface level. It's almost like when they are very hardworking with everything they do, except when it comes to studying the scriptures. And of course, at the heart is the problem that they don't believe the words of the scriptures. They don't believe that God has preserved all his words in the King James Bible. They don't believe the King James Bible is uh, the preserved word of God, which consists of all the words of God without error, without mistake. That God's breath is upon this book. They don't believe that. That's the problem. They correct the Bible. Instead of correcting their own thinking and changing their doctrines according to what the Bible says. That's the problem. But you see this, that there are exceptions to this rule. The rule is that the moment a sinner trusts Jesus Christ as his savior, he is baptized by the Holy Spirit. Okay, It happens... It happens at the moment of salvation. I'm sorry. It happens at the moment of salvation. Not uh, after that. That's the rule. But there are exceptions to the rule. And those exceptions we read in Acts 2, Acts 9, Acts chapter 8. Uh, like there are some strange things happening in the book of Acts, right? In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his family, immediately at the moment they, try, you know, they believe the message given by uh, Peter, even before they are baptized in water, they already receive the Holy Spirit. Strange things because it's a transitional book. God doesn't work in a set way. He keep, his, his dealings and his workings keep changing in the book of Acts. Till the gospel of the grace of God is firmly established by Paul. And it is understood by all groups involved. Alright, so that is about the second blessing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit 
happens at the moment of salvation. So don't ever seek for another uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're a born again Christian, you already have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we are going to talk about what this baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about. All right, I'm going to explain uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What happens when we are baptized by the Holy Spirit? Okay, but some of you who read church history or the biographies of great preachers might have come across this, that there were men like, let's say, Charles Finney and D.L. Moody. Uh, right? These two men were used greatly by God. Charles Finney was a great revivalist in the United States of America. So also was D.L. Moody, a great preacher of the gospel, who shook two continents for God, as they say, with his preaching. A mighty man, a mighty preacher of the gospel, D.L. Moody. He, they say he shook up the continent of America and Europe for the Lord Jesus Christ. God used him mightily. And uh, you read R. A. Torrey writing about D.L. Moody and how he experienced a second blessing. The same thing is with uh, uh, Charles Finney in his autobiography. It's a big book if you read it. He very uh, clearly explains the experience he's had of the baptism of the Holy Spirit later on after he was saved not at the moment of salvation and we know some of us would know would be familiar with the very famous incident that took place with D.L. Moody right he was praying asking God to give him the power to preach the gospel and all that and he was walking on the street one day and suddenly he felt the power of God coming upon him. And he knew he had to go somewhere, get down on his knees or fall prostrate and start worshipping God, praising and all that. So he went into a shop that was there nearby. He took permission from the shopkeeper and found a room where he could be by himself. And he fell prostrate and he started crying there, weeping. As he would ex and he says he was experiencing joy unspeakable and full of glory right and he had to say to the Lord Lord stay your hand or I'm going to die I cannot take this joy anymore and they say that after that day when D.L. Moody preached he preached just like he did before there was nothing different but what was different was the results the fruit people were getting saved they were brought into conviction of sin they were trusting Jesus Christ as a savior so you cannot deny that this man had this experience, nor can you deny the experience of uh, Charles Finney. I think he was on the floor the whole night when he received this, uh, you know, supposed baptism of the Holy Spirit and the joy. Both of the men have had similar experiences, that joy unspeakable and full of glory. And for both of them, their ministries changed afterwards. Uh, especially striking is what happened with Charles Finney. Of course, you have all these uh, Calvinists who attack Charles Finney, call him a wolf in sheep's clothing and uh, all sorts of things, right? Because they, call, they say he was unsaved. Of course, these proud fellows who believe that those who do not live like they do are not saved. That's at the heart of their teachings, though they will never say that. So Charles Finney was an unsaved fellow, he was a false teacher, he was a wolf in sheep's clothing, he must be burning in hell today, and all the people who he ministered to would be burning in hell today. That's what the Calvinists say. Notwithstanding what they say, we know God used Charles Finney mightily. Hundreds of thousands of people were saved. For these people, the Calvinists, salvation is a very difficult thing. They make it very difficult, like the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees made it very difficult. For, other, for themselves, they made it very easy, but for others, they made it very difficult with all their rules and uh, legalism. That's how the Calvinists are. Oh, easy believism, they say. Easy believism. They, you know, they were not really saved. As if God told them to sit in the judgment seat and judge somebody's salvation. As if they could know who's really saved or not. Right? People like John MacArthur preach these scary messages to their people saying, you know, 
in all probability you're not saved, you believed wrong and all that. Trying to scare them. But you see, thousands of thousands of people were saved in the ministry of Charles Finney. So what is it? What shall we say about it? There were other men too who had such similar experiences. I'm just giving you two examples. Charles Finney and D.L. Moody. What do you say to that? Are the charismatics right that they received a second blessing? First blessing is salvation. The second one is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And those men claimed that it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now I have to say this. Charles Finney and D.L. Moody were great men of God. There is no doubt. We would not be worthy to untie the shoelace of these men, right? Or even more than that. Unworthy of those men. But that doesn't mean they were infallible. That doesn't mean they were right in what they taught with things like this. Like claiming that the experience they had was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was not the baptism of the Holy Spirit that they had, even if they called it that. You, and you don't have to call them heretics for calling that experience they had as the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they saw in the scriptures that the experience they had was similar to the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. That's why they believed that, nothing wrong. They never uh, advocated that, you know, everybody should get this second blessing like the Charismatics do. No, they didn't. So the Calvinist accuse men like Charles Finney of being Charismatics or Pentecostals. No, they were not. Don't be silly. You're just, you know, too biased. That's what you are. But the thing is, what, so what about Charles Finney and D.L. Moody? I'll say this and close. Well, they certainly uh, experienced something more like what Paul experienced. Okay? And let me show you this. Look at Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 9 through 11. Verses 9 through 11. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist, and a darkness and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Alright, so this is about this guy named Bar-Jesus, uh, right? He's also called Elymas. And he opposed Paul and his preaching. And suddenly he was full of the Holy Spirit, Paul. What happened? Was he baptized by the Holy Spirit? No. He suddenly got filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what happened. And something similar would have happened to D.L. Moody or Charles Finney. They suddenly experienced the filling of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. They were endued with power from on high. Look at what Jesus said in the Gospel of Ma uh, Luke. Gospel of Luke chapter 24. Gospel of Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. When the Holy Spirit baptized the apostles in Acts chapter 2, he endued them with power. But we see that generally when the Holy Spirit baptizes a born-again Christian, he doesn't do that anymore. But probably in individual cases, he still does. Again, exceptions to the rule. Exceptions which prove the rule. Every born-again Christian who is baptized by the Holy Spirit don't receive the same power that D.L. Moody or Charles Finney experienced or other men of God have experienced for their ministries. They are certainly given some sort of power because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of power. And when he comes inside of us and baptizes us, he certainly gives us power to live a holy life. Right? Whether we use it or not, it's up to us. But he certainly empowers us. 
But this that happened with Finney and Moody is something else. It's an endowment of power for, for service. Right? Again, like the apostles, I'm not saying Finney and Moody were equal to the apostles, but something similar to what the apostles had. They had a special purpose of reaching masses with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, it was the Philadelphian church age, the church of the open door. The church which had a little strength but did not deny his name but kept his word. It's, the not, it's not the same today. The Pentecostal movement is a Laodicean church uh, period movement. An apostate movement. You cannot trust anything they teach. The charismatic especially. You must be very careful. They are like street magicians. Fooling people. You must be careful. So this teaching that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second blessing is false. It is something that happens at the moment of salvation. Every born again Christian, there is no exception. It's not like some are baptized with the Holy Spirit and some are not. That's what the Charismatics Pentecostals teach. Not everybody who is saved receives the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit afterwards. I'm telling you that is heresy heresy the bible says if you do not have the spirit of god you are none of his that means you do not belong to jesus christ if you are born again you have the holy spirit if you don't have the holy spirit you're not born again it's as simple as that all right so we will stop here for today and the lord willing we will continue studying the subject of the baptism of the holy spirit today we saw what baptism of the Holy Spirit is not. All right. And in the next Bible study, the Lord willing, we will look at what baptism of the Holy Spirit is according to the scriptures. I hope and pray that this Bible study has been a blessing to you. Thank you very much once again for joining us. God bless you. Well, somebody wrote to me and requested that after the Bible study, I move out of the picture for a few seconds so that they could look at